All right, let's work through practice set six where we do some market basket analysis. So the data that we're going to work with comes from a chain of bakeries, and we're given two different data files. We're going to read both of these in once I change to the appropriate working directory, and then make the transactional data from these two files. So receipts and products are just two different data frames. Products tells us basically what the ID number of each product is, like chocolate cake, lemon cake, etc. Receipts goes through and lets us know what items appeared in each one of the transactions. Now, to actually work with transactional data, we need to coerce it into that form, and that's what question number two has you do. Now, if you're doing market basket analysis all by yourself, you'll probably spend quite a bit of time figuring out how to exactly get the data into transactional form, but I don't want to waste time doing that here, so I've just provided the code for you, where we go and make the transactional object, we call it trans here, and we can use the expect command to explore all aspects of the transactional data. So for number two, I ask you to confirm that the first six transactions are as shown, and if you remember, what we have to do is not only use the square brackets to refer to a particular set of transactions, but also to use the command inspect. If I just try to do this like I would refer to the first six elements of a vector, I'm not going to get anything interesting out. Whenever I'm dealing with transactional data or market basket rules, I need to use that inspect command to see anything related to the analysis. All right, part B asks us to make the item frequency plot just to explore what the most frequently purchased items are. So I'm going to go and actually go to the association rules summary page because there's a lot of good and helpful code that we can just copy and paste. So we're asked to make the item frequency plot, so I'm going to go and search for just item frequency plot, and let's see what we can find. All right, so I'm going to copy both of these lines here and then do a little bit more careful reading of what the problem asks for. So we're going to plot the top 30 most frequently purchased items and we're going to add the horizontal equals true so that it's a little bit easier to read. So I'm going to go ahead and add in cex.names equals 0.7 so that the font size of the bars are small enough that they all fit nicely on the plot here. So there we go. I'm going to keep this as type equals absolute so that we actually have the total number of transactions that involve each of these different items. And we can see that Coffee Eclair is the most frequently purchased items, appearing about 8,000 times in the data. But a lot of other items are purchased comparable amounts. You know, it's not like we have a big drop off or anything after the top few different most purchased items. So there's a lot of items that are actually purchased really quite often here. All right, so when we start out with the market basket analysis, typically we're asking, all right, so overall, what fraction of transactions involve green tea? And then we ask, well, if I know that a certain set of other items are in the cart, now what fraction of those, uh, those carts contain green tea? The probability of green tea might go from being 5% overall, maybe up to 75%, given that some other items are in that cart. So the supports of these items give us these prior probabilities, the overall fraction of carts that contain a particular item, so that we have a baseline idea for how frequent purchases actually contain those items. So to get the supports of different items, we're going to use the item frequency command, and if we ask for item frequency trans here, the name of our transactional data, it'll print out the item frequencies of every single one of the items in the transactional data. And in this case, there's not too many different items that the bakery sells, so we could just look at this list and answer these questions here if I wanted to know what's the item frequency of green tea, the support of green tea. I would just have to go and try to do a treasure hunt and try to find where green tea is. And here we go, it's at about 6.2%. Now, of course, there's a much better way, because what we can do is we can refer to specific items by turning on the square brackets and putting into quotes what particular item we want to see. So item frequency trans is just a vector of numbers. It's these numbers that you see here. And each of these elements have a name. And remember, we can refer to the name of a vector just by turning on those square brackets and putting the name of the vector or name of the element in double quotes. 
So if we wanted to just extract green T out, well, there we go. If we wanted to extract out the support of more than one item, well, we could give it a vector of names. So we can get the support of green tea, vanilla meringue, and hot coffee all at once if we just make a vector containing those three items. So if I close out that vector, run the command, I can get the supports for all three of these items simultaneously. All right, so it's nice to know what fraction of carts contain particular items, but what we're really interested in studying are associations. What if I know that a cart contains hot coffee? What additional information regarding the presence of other items does that let me know about? So question number three asks us to find some of these association rules to do this market basket analysis. Now, to do market basket analysis, we need to provide a bit of input. Number one, we need to specify the support of the rules that we're interested in discovering. So we're not going to waste our time finding rules that will apply to every one in a million transactions. We're going to enforce some minimum support criteria. And in this case, we're going to say we're only interested in rules that will apply to at least 100 transactions. So the support of the rules that we're finding have to be at least 100 divided by the length of the transactions, however many transactions we have, which is 75,000. So we want to make sure the rules are pre prevalent enough to be useful, to have meaningful uh, decision-based consequences on them, and 100 seems like a pretty good number. Now, the next thing we need to specify is how confident do we want to be in these rules? Once again, we're not going to waste our time finding rules that are correct only 10% of the time, 20% of the time. In this case, let's go ahead and restrict our attention to rules that are correct, you know, the majority of the time, at least 60%. All right, so what we do is we head on over to the summary file and look to see where we talk about how we uh, develop these rules. So here's the relevant line of code. I'm going to highlight this line and just borrow it to put it into the practice set and figure out what we need to change. So trans is the name of our transactional data. We'll keep that the same. And the parameter equals list gives us how we want to find these rules. Basically, what are the criteria that we want these rules to satisfy? So in this case, what we want is we want the rules to apply to at least 100 transactions. So the support, the fraction of carts to which these rules apply, needs to be 100 over the length of trans. If I evaluate this as a fraction, we're essentially saying that each rule needs to apply to at least 0.133% of transactions out there. And then we want the rules to be correct at least 60% of the time. And in this case, it says don't put any restriction on the length of the rules just yet. So we're going to delete the min len and max len arguments. We're going to let it find all the rules that it possibly can find as long as it meets this minimum support threshold and this minimum threshold for confidence. This control equals list for both equals false is an optional argument. You never have to include it. It just prevents some extraneous lines of code being printed to the screen as the command is running. So let's go ahead and run this command. So we found all of the relevant rules. And the first thing that we're going to do is to remove any redundant rules. So redundant rules are rules that are basically more complex than simpler rules that have a lower level of confidence. And so this is why we want to remove them. It's not really worth our time to talk about more complex objects that are less correct than simpler things. So we're going to remove the redundant rules by running this command here and looking to see, all right, how many rules do we have left over? So rules is an object created by transactions. We can use a normal commands like length to figure out how many there are. So there's 102 rules. And in fact, let's go back and see if any redundant rules were eliminated. Sometimes they exist, sometimes they don't. And it looks like in this case, 102 before and after removing the redundant rules, it looks like there must not have been any redundancies found the first go around. All right, so let's answer the rest of the questions. Part A wants us to look at the 55th rule in the set. Now, there's not any particular order in how they're stored in the rules object that we created. We can sort them based on whatever criteria that we want, but there's nothing special about the 55th rule in this set. It's not like the 55th most important, the 55th most prevalent. It's kind of in an arbitrary order, but let's just go ahead and look to see what is the 55th element of the rule set. 
Now, it's just like a vector in that I can put in the square brackets and refer to a particular element, but because this is created from a set of transactions, I'm going to have to say inspect in order to actually see what that rule is. So I'll say inspect rules bracket 55 to see the 55th rule. All right, so what is this rule telling me? Well, this rule is about finding coffee eclairs in a shopping cart, the value in the RHS or the right-hand side of the rule. And this rule is letting me know that if I know that a cart has apple pie and almond twist in it, then it may also have coffee eclair. And we'll get some practice interpreting these numbers, but it's essentially telling me that if I do know that a cart has apple pie and almond twist, the probability of finding coffee eclair in it is about 93.6%, pretty darn high. So it looks like that this rule gives me quite a bit of information as to whether coffee eclair is going to be in a cart if I know that these two particular items are already in that transaction. All right, part B asks us to get a little practice doing subsets. We'd like to inspect a subset made where apple pie is on the right-hand side of the rules. So the presence of what combinations of items imply the existence of apple pie? Let's go ahead and find out. The subset command works with transactional data just like it works with normal vectors or with data frames. All we have to say is what we're taking a subset of. In this case, we're taking a subset of the rules. And then we need to specify the logical condition on the rules that we want to extract, that we want to investigate. So in this case, we want to know where on the right-hand sides do we find apple pie. And the way that we do this is to type out RHS and then percentage in and give it a vector of items that we're interested in. Now, in this case, we just want to know about apple pie. So our vector is just a length one here. And if I go and run this command, it's not going to actually show me what these rules are because I haven't done inspect, but it lets me know that, hey, there's four rules that involve apple pie on the right-hand side. That confirms the hint right here. Now to see them, of course, we put inspect around our subset, and here's our set of four rules. So if I want to know something about the presence of apple pie, if I want to know what combinations of items indicate that the probability of finding apple pie is bigger than what it starts out to be, well, here's my four rules. So if I know that coffee eclair and almond twist is in the transaction, then apple pie may be in there as well. And in fact, the probability is very high, 92.5% chance of finding apple pie when coffee eclair and almond twist are in the transaction. All right, part C asks us to do a little bit more with the subset command. So I'll go ahead and use inspect so that we can see the results of taking these subsets. We want to inspect a subset made where both raspberry cookie and green tea appear on the left-hand side of the rule. So this question is basically asking us to investigate what happens when we know that raspberry cookie and green tea are part of the transaction. What other items might exist once we know that these two are in the transaction? So once again, we'll use that subset command. We're taking a subset of the rules. Now, how do we specify a particular set of items on the left-hand side? Well, the logical condition we're going to put in is LHS for left-hand side, and once again, percentage in, and then I'll just put in the items that I'm interested in finding. So I'll put raspberry cookie, and then green tea as well, and I'm gonna run this, and I'm gonna see that actually this isn't quite the subset that I want. I'm going to have to change something about this command, but let's look at the results first. So I want a subset where both raspberry cookie and green tea appear on the left-hand side. And so if I make this a little bit bigger, we have a lot of digits here. Let me run this command again. I see that, well, you know, rule number 36, that's not really quite what I was looking for. I see that raspberry cookie is on the left-hand side, but it's missing green tea. So here's a good lesson. This percentage in shortcut, which we've used a lot so far in this class, isn't actually what we want when we need both of the items on the left-hand side. There's a shortcut for this that just works for transactional data. Percentage a in is short for all in. So if I want to write you know, a subset where I have both raspberry cookie and green tea, I essentially want transactions where raspberry cookie and green tea, all of those are in, the left-hand side. So I actually want LHS percentage A in. And once I run this, I can see that, all right, here we go, raspberry cookie green tea. We 
imply the existence of many other items actually once we know that these two items are in there. So this last rule right here, if I know that raspberry cookie and green tea is part of the transaction, well then lemon lemonade also has a pretty good chance of being there. In fact, about a 90% chance of also being part of that transaction. All right, and then finally for part D, we're gonna expect to inspect a subset made where both at least one of vanilla frappuccino or cherry soda appear on the left-hand side. So that's super awkward wording on my part. I'm gonna get delete this both here because what I'm really wanting to get is a subset where at least one of these two items appear on the left-hand side. And that's actually gonna be the job for the percentage in shortcut. Percentage in finds the items um, where at least one of those elements appear in the vector to the right-hand side of that. And so if I just wanna copy and paste the vanilla frappuccino, copy and paste the cherry soda, then my command is essentially saying, all right, let's look at a subset of the rules where the left-hand side contains at least one of vanilla frappuccino or cherry soda. Might have both, might just have one. That's what percentage in gets us. Percentage all in means that everything in this vector has to be part of the left-hand side. So let's take a look. And we, have, we find 11 transactions. So here's a particularly involved one. If I know that apple tart, apple danish, and cherry soda are part of a transaction, then apple croissant may be part of that transaction as well. And in fact, that probability is pretty high, about 99.3% chance that apple croissant is going to be in that transaction if I know that three, these three items are part of that transaction. All right, question four asks us to do some sort of important mining when it comes to these association rules. We basically want to look at the top five rules in terms of confidence. So the confidence goes from zero to one. 100% confident means that we're 100% sure this rule is going to apply to our carts. And very often those are some of the most interesting ones. So we found a lot of rules here. We found a total of 112. Let's go ahead and sort them by confidence and look at the top five. All right, so I'm gonna run this line that says, hey, let's make sure we're reporting seven digits total. I didn't change this before, but sometimes it's useful to change the number of digits that are reports. And so we're back to the default of digits equals seven. All right, so since we're gonna be looking at these rules, we'll go ahead and do inspect. And because we wanna look at the top five, well, we can use head. Just like with a vector, we'll look at the first five elements of something. We just need to sort our rules by confidence. So let's sort our rules by confidence. And since we want the ones with the highest values up at the top, we're gonna to say decreasing equals false or true. We want the highest at the top. And then as we go down the list, we want the confidence de to decrease. So we do indeed want decreasing equals true. All right, so head, print out the top six. We can change one argument to actually say we just want the top five, put in a comma five along with the arguments in head. All right, so here's our top five rules. So three of these rules actually have 100% confidence. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that if we're dealing with a transaction that has raspberry cookie, lemon cookie, raspberry lemonade, and green tea, well, then there's a 100% chance we're also going to find lemon lemonade. And you might think that that's a pretty complex looking rule. That might be a really specific, really rare case, but it's actually not. If we look at the number of rules or the number of carts that this transaction um, in the data has, where this rule applies, we find that this actually applies to 1,555 of the transactions. So it's by no means a rare rule. It actually applies to quite a lot of transactions here. So part A asks, well, where does this 1555 come from? Uh, previous versions of the A rules package didn't actually report the number of transactions to which the rule applied. Kind of left you hanging in that regard, but we were actually able to calculate it from some of the numbers that appear associated with the rule here. So where does this 1555 come from? Well, it's a, kind of related to the number of transactions that we have, which in this case is 75,000 and the support of the rule set. All right, so this number here in the support column tells us the fraction of transactions 
to which this rule applies. So it's telling us that this rule, complex as it is, actually applies to about 2% of all the transactions that we have in the data. And well, what is 2% of 75,000? Well, if we ask for the length of trans times the support, multiply those together, that's where this 1555 comes from. So one of the important things to remember about the numbers that are output by these rules, the support simply tells us the fraction of transactions to which the rule applies. And if we want to have the actual number of transactions, we can just look at the count, but that's where the count comes from. Take the total number of transactions, multiply it by the support of the rule, and we get that count. All right, part B asks us to see if we can get the 1555 by running something like length trans which trans percentage all in. So that's kind of a big command. Let's break it down. So what I'm asking is let's actually try to figure out how many transactions contain all five of these items. So, all right, we know that the percentage A in shortcut is what we're going to want because we want to take a subset where every single element of a vector here containing these five names appear in that transaction. So let's try this out. What if we say trans percentage A in and then give it a vector of all of these names here? So raspberry cookie, lemon cookie, all of these in quotes because they're words, raspberry lemonade, green tea, and finally the right hand side of that rule which was lemon lemonade. So if I run this command, well, this is a logical statement, so I'm going to get trues and falses back. When I get a false, that means that, okay, that transaction doesn't contain all of these items. But if I get a true back, that means that this transaction actually does contain every single one of those items. So rather conveniently, we know that the 76th transaction contains all of those items. Let's take a look. Let's confirm that. So trans bracket 76, let's inspect it. And indeed, this transaction has exactly that set of items, no more, no less, exactly those five. Now, there might be some other places where we find trues where it contains more than just those items. So let's take one more inspection. Looks like rule 825 or transaction 825 actually contains that exact set as well. So the transactions might have more items than this, but by doing percentage A in, we guarantee that the transaction contains exactly these five items, so at least these five items here. So, all right, we want to basically figure out, well, how many of these transactions contain at least these five items? So we can essentially just count up the number of trues that we get from running this uh, command. So we could actually say, all right, well, true is the number one, false is the number zero. So if I took the sum of all these trues and falses, that would actually get me that 1555. So this is an alternative way of doing it. It's basically saying, all right, the which trans percentage a in this vector here would essentially just take a subset of the transactions that have at least those five items. And then doing length was going to count up the number of transactions associated with that. This is a little bit of an easier way, so we'll stick with that. All right, question five asks us to remake the association rules with different conditions. So now we want the support to be at least 100 carts. That's actually what we had before. We want the confidence to only be 50%. So if something's on the left-hand side, that's going to imply the existence of the item on the right-hand side with a probability of at least 50%. And we want the maximum length to be two. Well, what does the maximum length refer to? Well, remember, the length of a rule set is the total number of items involved on the left and the right-hand side. So a maximum length of two are rules that look like if A, then B. So we're going to be looking at some pretty simple rules here. So let's go ahead and make rules two to be this new sub, these new set of rules here. I'm going to borrow the code from up here. So rules two, the a priori algorithm operating on the trans transactional data, the support at least 100 carts that change that doesn't change. The confidence is going to be 50%. That's our minimum threshold, and we want the max length of the rules to be two.
So let's run this. We get the warning message that says basically, hey, I made the exact set of rules that you wanted me to. I only return patterns up to a length of two, exactly as requested. So let's go ahead and actually inspect these rules. It's not too many of them. There's only 14 pretty simple rules. And what else are we asked to do here? Well, the one with the highest confidence, which really isn't all that high as we scan through this list, we're seeing stuff in the 50% range here. The one with the highest confidence is apricot danish, implying the existence of cherry tart. So essentially, if we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction, then cherry tart may also be part of that transaction. And in fact, there's a 57.4% chance that cherry tart will be part of that transaction if apricot danish is involved. So let's go ahead and interpret some of these numbers here. Specifically, this question wants us to interpret the value of the lift of 6.156. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to talk about how the chance of finding cherry tart, that's on the right hand side of the rule, how that chance changes once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction. Now we know where that probability ends up, it's going to end up at about 57%. We want to do the full interpretation talking about well what does the probability of, cherry, of finding cherry tart start given no other information about items in the cart, and then how much does it increase by, where does it end up? All right, so to do this, part A tells us to first find the overall frequency that cherry tart appears in the data. All right, well, let's use the item frequency command to do this. The item frequency of trans bracket cherry tart tells us that overall 9.3% of carts can chain, contain cherry tart. So the prior probability of finding cherry tart as part of a transaction is about 9.3%. Now this association rules tells us that, well, once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction, the probability of finding cherry tart is going to be different. In fact, it's going to change, it's going to go up by a factor of 6.156. So the lift is telling us the factor by which the probability of finding cherry tart increases once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction. So, okay, let's go ahead and write out our response. The probability of finding cherry tart as part of a transaction increases from 9.3%, which is the support, in other words, the prior probability So it increases from 9.3% up by a factor of 6.16 here, the lift, to the level of confidence, about 57.4%. Once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction. And so that's how we fully interpret some of these rules that we're discovering. So the right hand side of the rule tells us essentially the item that we're focused in on here, in this case, cherry tart. We know that overall 9.3% of transactions involve cherry tart. And this rule tells us that, well, once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction, the probability of finding cherry tart goes from 9.3% up by a factor of 6.16 up to 57.4%. So that probability of finding cherry tart skyrockets once we know that apricot danish is part of the transaction. And in fact, we can actually get this 57.35, etc., by taking the lift times that prior probability, the support of cherry tart. We can see that these numbers match up exactly here. All right, so that's one of the ways that we can interpret the lift. Remember, there's another way of interpreting what the lift tells us. It's essentially talking about how often we find both items involved in this rule compared to shoppers picking items at random. So the lift also is telling us that apricot danish and cherry tart are appearing in carts 6.16 times more frequently than what we would expect when shoppers were just picking items at random. So we're seeing these two items together in carts way more often 
than shoppers that are basically picking items with no rhyme or reason. All right, part B asks us to determine whether or not the rules are statistically significant. So we just talked about shoppers picking items at random, and if we do have a whole collection of shoppers picking items at random, every now and then we're gonna get just a very fortuitous combination of transactions that happen to involve particular combinations of items just very often. So we'd like to know, okay, is this value of the lift, 6.16, a value that could be fairly easily produced by shoppers just picking items at random? Or is it really indicative of a real association? So we're going to go to the summary, R code here, and we're going to look for the analysis of significance. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the interest measure and is.significant commands, and we're going to borrow these here. All right, so what we want to do is we essentially want to look at this particular rule, which was rule number 13. So let's go ahead and type in rules 2 bracket 13. Since rules 2 is the set of rules that we found. And let's go ahead and run this. So we get a zero out. That's technically the p-value of this association rule. We're not going to worry too much about that. Instead, we're going to look to see is the uh, result of running is.significant true or false. So here's how we interpret this. If we see true, that means that this association rule is statistically significant. What is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that it's pretty darn unlikely for shoppers picking items at random to be able to produce a lift at least as big as 6.16. So in this sense, it somewhat legitimizes using this association rule to make decisions. So if we know that shoppers that typically buy apricot danish also buy cherry tart, well, one thing we could do, let's say if we wanted to get rid of our supply of cherry tarts, is to develop some sort of promotion like, hey, buy an apricot danish and get a cherry tart at 50% off. So number one, we know that typically buyers of apricot danish are going to be interested in cherry tart and so we're going to be basically giving the customers a favor the ones that would have been buying cherry tart to begin with but because they are there is an association here maybe those that haven't considered cherry tart but are very likely to enjoy it might be you know very tempted to take us up on that offer It'd probably drive sales of cherry tart so the response to this question is this rule is statistically significant. The lift of 6.16 is very unlikely to occur if shoppers were picking items at random. And in fact, I'm going to go back and make this even more specific. I'm going to say that a lift of at least 6.6, 6.16, so 6.16 or higher is very unlikely to occur if shoppers were picking items at random. Technically, when we study the statistical significance of association rules, we're talking about finding a rule that is at least as strong, basically having at least as large of a lift, as the one that we observed in the data. All right, so this looks like it's a pretty legitimate rule to actually base decisions on. It's statistically significant, very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely, for shoppers picking items at random to produce a lift at least as large as what we observed. All right, question number six asks us to do some sort of graphical visualization of these rules. And this is very useful because it can be kind of difficult to just scan through a list of rules and to discover kind of more interesting structures, relationships between rules. So for this question, I just go ahead and give you what the code is in order to make the set of rules we want to investigate. So let's talk about what those rules are. Well, we're making rules that have a support of at least 2.5%. So these rules have to apply to at least 2.5% of the transactions. And the confidence has to be at least 80%. Now there's a restriction on the max length of three. So basically we're co uh, considering rules up to a maximum complexity of if A and B, then C. So let's go ahead and make these simple rules. We get that warning message saying, hey, we only found rules up to a length of three. That's exactly what we wanted. 
and then we'll remove any redundant ones. So what we'll do is we'll run the graph command. We'll ignore this weird backtrace environmental variable that doesn't really tell us anything important here because we actually did get the graph. So there's a lot of information on this graph. Number one, it tells us that the size of these dots here indicate the support of the rule. So there's a lot of transactions that involve this opera cake, cherry tart, and some sort of Danish, the apricot Danish. These smaller dots, like this cluster of three over here, relatively small, so these are applying to fewer transactions than, say, these guys. The color is related to the, the lift, so the darker the color, basically the stronger that association, the larger the value of the lift here. So we're asked, in this case, to describe some sort of insight that the graph provides us that would not have been immediately obvious from just scanning through the list of rules. So if we were to inspect these rules, well, that's a lot of stuff. You know, who knows what extra information is kind of lurking around in here. Now, visually, what we can see is some stuff that's actually pretty interesting. And I'm going to go ahead and click the export command. I'm going to go to save as PDF, and I'm just going to make this plot a little bit bigger. I'm going to change the size to 1515, and I'm going to click preview. So the dots stay the same amount, but now these things are a little bit more readable. So what are we finding? Well, we're finding some small clusters of rules. We have this set of one, two, three, four items that are involved in a lot of rules, kind of all self-referentially. Now remember, the length of these rules are just three. So we basically have a cluster of rules that say, you know, all these things are connected here. Lemon lemonade and lemon cookie, if those two appear in the cart, they're also going to apply the existence of raspberry lemonade, and they're also going to apply the existence of raspberry cookie. That we can confirm just by going through methodically all these rules here. There's so many arrows that that's actually a little bit difficult to interpret. So let's uh, talk about something else here. So first, actually, let's go about how we actually interpret one of these plots. So the way that we interpret these plots is we look for a dot. Each dot represents a rule. And we're going to look for the arrows that go into the dot and the arrows that go out of the dot. So in this case, this dot is representing a rule that involves apple tart, so we see an arrow going in, and it also involves apricot or apple danish, which is also going into this dot. Now coming out of the dot is an arrow pointing to apple croissant. So this particular rule is essentially telling us that if apple tart and apple danish are part of the transaction, the two things going into the dot, then apple croissant may be part of that transaction as well. So the arrow pointing to apple croissant leaving that dot tells us essentially the right-hand side of that rule. So we see that once again we have these three items here that are all kind of self-referential. We see apple croissant pointing this to this dot, apple tart pointing to this dot, and that points to apple danish. Likewise, apple danish, apple croissant, points to apple tart. We see this cluster of these three items here. Now, something that wouldn't be apparent from just looking at that list of rules is something like this, where we see coffee eclair and hot coffee kind of looking as a bridge or serving as a bridge between different sets of rules. So coffee eclair right here, what we see is that, okay, it is the consequent of the rule single espresso and blackberry tart, if both those items are in the cart, pointing to this rule right here, then coffee eclair may be part of that transaction as well. And what we see is that coffee eclair is actually the left-hand side of some rules as well. We see coffee eclair pointing to both of these dots right here. What else is pointing to these dots? Well, you know, this is when I wish those arrows were a little bit uh, smaller here, but I think almond twist is pointing towards here. And then what's coming out? Well, unfortunately, here's one of the drawbacks about how they updated the plotting procedure of this, is that it's now it's getting very, very tricky to see where these arrows are pointing out, what they're actually pointing to. So this plot, sadly, unfortunately, is not as interpretable as I would like it to be, just because of the way they changed the plotting procedure. But one insight that we can gain is that coffee eclair, hot coffee, is kind of serving as a bridge between different clusters of rules. And we also see that some sets of items are very, very involved self-referentially in clusters of rules here. So lemon lemonade, lemon cookie, raspberry lemonade, raspberry cookie. 
apple tart, apple danish, apple croissant, etc. All right, so what can we say about this? Let's cancel out of there. We can say that there are some isolated clusters of rules. like lemon, lemonade, raspberry cookie, raspberry lemonade, and lemon cookie. And, you know, that actually by itself, I think, kind of suggests something. It says that, hey, lemon and raspberry seem to really go well together here. So maybe we'll add that as an insight. And we've also seen items that really serve as a bridge between different clusters of rules as well. So for example, copy eclair, we see it serves as a bridge here between the single espresso blackberry tart and some of these other pastries. And hot coffee is also serving as a bridge between blueberry tart, apricot croissant, and some of these other pastries as well. So they're both in the left-hand side and in the right-hand side of different sets of rules, different clusters of rules. So that's kind of interesting. All right, question number seven asks us to start doing some decision-making based on the rules that we're discovering. So the boss would like to use the association rules to increase revenues. So we're asked to create yet another item set here. So let's borrow our a priori command and see what we want to do. Okay, what we, I'll call them new rules here. A priori on the transactional data. We want to make sure that the support is at least 50 out of 75,000. So our rules are going to apply to at least 50 carts. The confidence has to be at least 50%, and the maximum length has to be 2. So once again, a very simple set of rules if A, then B. And we'll remove the redundant rules if there happen to be any. Sometimes there are, sometimes they're not. So let's make these. And the first bullet point talks about blackberries. I love blackberries. I would love to have pastries that have blackberries in it. So question becomes, hey, you know, are there any rules that involve blackberry tart? Well, let's just look. So we can inspect new rules. There's not too many, so we can just scan through the left, scan through the right. I don't see any blackberry tart, which is a little disappointing. I would hope some rules have uh, uh, kind of applied to that item, but I don't see any, any. So it looks like there aren't any. But, you know, maybe this, uh, this was bigger, you know, just eyeballing it wouldn't be the best way to go about doing stuff. So let's actually write a command that kind of proves that there's no items involving BlackBerry Tart. So I'm going to define a subset of these rules. I'm going to call it S, where on the left-hand side, I want to see BlackBerry Tart. or the vertical bar here, on the right-hand side, I want to see blackberry tart. So if it's on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side, then that rule involves blackberry tart in some form. And so I can look for that subset and I can look to see, well, how many rules did you find? Zero. So we've conclusively proved that, you know, there's just no blackberry tart anywhere in this rule set. All right, the second bullet point asked us to look at chocolate coffee and chocolate cake here. And it's a symmetric rule set in this case because the existence of one implies the existence of the other and vice versa here. And because the support, of course, is evolving the same two items here, they're going to be the same number. And the lift is also always going to be the same number as well. The ordering of the items, what's on the left or what hand, what's on the right hand side, actually doesn't change the value of the lift. But the confidences may change depending on the composition of the other items in the carts. So the levels of the confidence is rather low here, just a little bit over 50%. We do find that the support is relatively high. About 4.4 of these transactions involve both chocolate coffee and chocolate cake. So 
we are going to recommend to the boss some sort of course of action that takes advantage of this rule and which may increase profits. Well, one thing that we see is that because chocolate coffee and chocolate cake appear in carts very often together, that basically implies that there's a large fraction of customers out there that enjoy both these together. And there may be a subset of customers that are enjoying one, but haven't quite discovered how awesome it is to have the other simultaneously. So one thing you could do with this uh, set of rules here is to apply a promotion, like buy a, a chocolate coffee and get, you know, a dollar off chocolate cake or vice versa. You know, enjoy a chocolate cake and get 25 cents off a chocolate coffee. So you'll be throwing away a little bit of money because there's a large fraction of customers that are going to buy both of these items together. But the existence of this rule set basically says that, hey, you know, there's a good chance that a customer that enjoys chocolate coffee is also going to enjoy chocolate cake. For those customers that haven't quite discovered how great those are together, well, kind of push them in the right direction by offering a promotion. So one thing could be like buy a piece of chocolate cake and enjoy a chocolate coffee for 25 cents off. So that'll encourage people to buy the chocolate coffee when chocolate cake is being purchased. A large fraction of customers enjoy this combination, so let's try to expose other customers who haven't discovered this uh, to this combination as well. And the great thing is, is that even if you are initially throwing away some sort of money here, some customers are going to buy these both anyway, you know, by having and exposing more customers to this combination, you're probably going to sell more of this combination in the future when this discount no longer applies. So you could be really devious and say, all right, once I get customers hooked on this com uh, combination, after this promotion expires, you know, bump up the price of one or both of those items here. They love this combination. They're addicted to it now. So let's jack up the price just a little bit. All right, question number eight asks us to explore a new product. So we're trying out a new product. We'll leave that unspecified. And the data that we have regarding this new product is that after 5,000 transactions, it was fairly popular. It was found in 300 of those transactions. So when doing a market basket analysis, we found that some other item that it appeared to be associated with in transactions was bottled water. So it looks like that um, both of those items, bottled water and this new item, appeared in 37 transactions together. Bottled water appeared in 375 transactions. So this is actually all the data that we need to talk about the lift of the association rule. If bottled water, then new product or vice versa. So what we're going to want to do is figure out the lift of that association rule which would be basically be, you know, how often are these two items appearing in carts, uh, as opposed to how often we would expect if shoppers were picking items at random. And this problem right here is getting you a little bit of practice using the lift function and the exact p-val lift function that I had written. So how do we use this? Well, to figure out the lift of the association rule, let's write out the association rule. So if bottled water then new product, that's basically what it is. The lift of that rule is going to be given to us by this function. We just have to fill in the pieces. So n is 5,000, the number of transactions that we have. n a is the number of carts that had this new product, 300. n b is the number of carts that have bottled water, which was 375. And n a b is the number of transactions that have both, which was 37. So if we define this function and then run this, we find that the lift is about 1.6. So it looks like that bottled water and this new product are appearing in carts about 1.64 times more frequently than what we would expect if shoppers were just picking items at random here. So a bit of an increase in the probability of finding this new product in the cart once we know that bottled water is there. We'd like to know, okay, well, is this lift, is this association rule statistically significant? So we know just by a fortuitous combination of events, we expect shoppers to accidentally have this new product in bottled water in some number of carts accidentally, just by chance. So the exact p-value 
of the lift is going to quantify that chance for us. So same set of arguments here. I should probably define it. And here we go. All right, so if this was the only association we studied, and if it's when it's the only association, we can take this number at face value. If we studied a million associations, we need to do some adjusting here. We won't worry about that right now. But we'll imagine this is the only association that we studied. Would this rule be statistically significant? Would this rule be something that we can act on? Well, the answer is yes, because this p-value is less than the fiducial threshold of 5%. So the p-value is 0 0.0015, which is less than the standard 5% threshold. What is this number actually telling us? Well, let's do a careful job interpreting this. So what this tells us is that this means that there's a 0.15%, that's just this in percent notation, a 0.15% chance that shoppers picking items at random would produce a lift at least as large as 1.6444, etc. by chance. So while it's possible that shoppers just picking items at random could get 37 carts that contain this new product in bottled water, it's very unlikely there's a 0.15% uh, chance that shoppers picking items at random would have been able to produce a lift at least as what we observed, meaning there's a 0.15% chance that shoppers would have ended up with at least 37 transactions containing both of these items if they were just picking items at random. So it is statistically significant. This implies that this has some sort of actionable insight that we can use to base decisions on. All right, question number nine really changes gears here and starts talking about, all right, how can we use association rules in market basket analysis to do some sort of predictive analytics? And that's about where we're to be headed after the midterm exam is how can we develop some sort of model, some sort of algorithm to make predictions into the future regarding what's going to happen a week or a month from now or what's going to happen for customers that we haven't quite acquired. So the ex6.click dataset contains a bunch of information about whether or not viewers on a website did or did not click on an ad. So we have the click column, which is yes or no, did they or did they not click on that ad, and then a bunch of information about that ad. Now this actually comes from a Kaggle competition, and unfortunately they always anonymize what those predictor variables are. So I couldn't really tell you what x1, x2, x3, etc. are. I couldn't tell you exactly what device the ad was being viewed on. It's all anonymized here, but it still gives us a chance to figure out, well, is there some sort of magical sweet combination of these parameters that seem particularly successful in having users click on the ad? So let's do some sort of market basket analysis in this sort of context. First, what's the overall probability that someone clicks on an ad? What's this prior probability or what's the support of yes, essentially, if we treat each individual here as a transaction and whether they did or did not click as essentially an item in the cart. So let's look at a table of the click column here. We see that, okay, well, clicking is very much in the minority. Let's go ahead and divide the result of running table by the number of rows so that we can turn these numbers into percentages. So it looks like overall there's about a 17.6% chance that a random user here is going to click on that ad. So there's about a 17.6% chance that an individual will click on the ad. So it's kind of like a market basket analysis. You know, there's a 9.3% chance that a transaction is going to involve cherry tart. There's a 17.6% chance that a transaction is going to involve a click. Basically, a user going onto this website, looking at an ad, and either deciding to click or to not click on it. And so the question becomes, all right, are there any combinations of characteristics about that ad that yield to an increased probability of clicking on it? 
maybe if they view it on device D10 and the banner position is in position two and the ad is displayed on site ID S3, maybe that, for whatever reason, makes this probability of clicking much, much higher than this overall baseline rate of 17.6%. Let's do some sort of investigation. So I'm going to skip part B for right now, and we're going to convert the data frame that we're working with to transactional form. Once again, if you have to do this on your own, it's going to take a little bit of time to figure out exactly how you do this. And we're not going to waste our time doing that in this class. I'll just give you the code here. So we've converted the data frame into transactional format. So each transaction is a user and we're treating basically yes as an item in the cart. We're looking to see what fraction of carts contain yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the a priori algorithm with these uh, parameters here. So we're going to make sure that whatever rules we're discovering apply to at least 163 individuals. This is the number of transactions that we have. And we want to make sure that the confidence of these rules is at least 35%. Now this might sound pretty low, but it's really not all that bad because we know that we start out with 17.6% of users clicking on that ad. If we make sure that our rules have at least 35% confidence, that means that the rules that we're finding imply that among those particular types of ads, the click-through rate is at least 35%. And so this is like a doubling of the probability of clicking on that ad. 35% confidence actually starts to sound pretty good. All right, these additional arguments just talk about what we actually want to be seeing on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the rules. So we're not really going to care about rules of the form. Well, if the ad is on site category SCAT1, then it's going to be on site domain SD2. No, we don't care about that stuff. We just want those rules where click equals to yes is on the right-hand side. We need to know what combinations of characteristics are associated with clicking. So we'll run the rules command. It'll go through. It gives us a warning message that only patterns up to a length of 10. That's a phenomenally complex rule. We're returned, and that's fine. So how many rules were found? Ooh, about 4,000. Let's remove the redundant ones. Almost every single one of those rules was redundant. More complex, but not as accurate. So we actually have a small number of rules that we can actually just look at and talk about. So let's sort these rules by confidence and expect them. All right, so what are these rules telling us? Well, all of the consequence of the rules, the RHS, are click equal to yes. So if we're treating these as transactions, the presence of these two items, banner position equals position two, site domain equals SD5, that implies that click equals to yes is likely a part of that transaction. So exactly what we want to see. What characteristics of the ad is associated with clicking? So let's just go ahead and interpret this rule since we're on it here. This rule is essentially telling us that when an ad has the characteristic banner position equals position two and site domain equals SD5, the probability of clicking is 46.4%. It's actually pretty darn big. So overall, we know that there's about a 17.6% chance that a user is going to click on the ad. But for ads with this combination of characteristics, that click-through rate skyrockets up by a factor of 2.62 to basically 46%. So a huge bump in the click-through rate when the ads have these characteristics, indicating that, hey, this is a pretty successful combination. So position two might be on the left-hand side of the page, the right-hand side of the page. We're not privy to that information, but it's definitely telling us that, hey, position matters. It's also telling us that site domain matters as well. SD5 looks to be particularly effective when combined with putting the ad in banner position two here. All right, so we can use some of these rules to help sculpt how we're displaying these ads. So if we're interested in knowing what value of X5 is the best, well, we can scan through these rules and see if X5 is in any one of these rules. And it is. We see that X5 equals type one is in rule number one. And as we scan down here, well, that's actually the only appearance of X5. It looks like that if X5 is equal to type one, then the probability of clicking becomes 49%, a huge increase, a factor of 2.8 increase over just the overall 
click-through rate of all ads out there. So type one is definitely the best value for X5. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty informative for making decisions. What about X3? Well, scanning through, we see X3 equal to B is associated with the highest click-through rate. Scanning through everything else, well, we don't see values of X3. So X3 equals to B is clearly the best choice in this case. What about the banner position? Is that the bet? Is there like a definitive um, best position here? Or does the answer depend on other variables? So let's look at where we find banner position. Well, here is banner position 2, banner position 2, banner position 2, 2, 2, 2. So 2 across the board. It looks like no matter what, position 2 is the more advantageous banner position. All right, so we can make some sort of decisions now based on the market basket analysis. You know, it looks like the most successful ads, you know, have X5 equal to type one, have X3 equal to B, have banner position equal to uh, position two, etc. It's lending us some pretty useful insight how to design some of these ads. All right, well, part D asks us to basically repeat that analysis, but now, to focus in on very unsuccessful ads, those with very high probabilities of clicking or of not clicking. Overall, 82.3% of users don't click on the ad, so are there any particularly ineffective characteristics of these ads? Well, let's do the same thing. Let's just borrow this code. And in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change click equal to yes to click equal to no here. And in this case, we're going to be a little bit more stringent in how applicable these rules are. We're going to make sure these rules will apply to at least a thousand different users. Not clicking is a bit more prevalent, so we can be a little bit more stringent over how many of these transactions, how many of these users actually don't click on that ad. So we're going to change this 35% confidence to 90% confidence because you know we're starting out with 82.3% of the users not clicking on that ad. So after we study these characteristics, that probability needs to be even higher for not clicking. So 90% makes sense. All right, so let's make those rules. Let's see how many there are. Ooh, 7,600. Let's remove those redundant rules. How many are left? Just 22. Let's sort them by confidence and let's inspect it. So at the top are gonna be the rules with the highest confidence. And in this case, highest confidence means the highest probability of not clicking here. So it looks like banner position in position one, app category AC1, and an X7 value of BB, particularly ineffective with the click-through rate. Initially, it starts out at 82.4% not clicking on the ad, and that skyrockets up to about 95% not clicking on the ad, when the ad has this particular set of three characteristics. So these rules are pretty helpful for learning basically what to avoid when it comes to designing one of these ads. So what site ID is the worst? Well, as we scan down here, we see site ID of S4 has a particularly bad click-through rate. 94.86% uh, of those users are not clicking on the ad when it's site ID S4. It looks like that's the only site ID that we see. What about site category here? Well, going through site category, site category two looks to be bad because it's on this list. And it's about all where we see it. What about banner position? Is there a bad banner position? Or does the answer depend on some other variables? Well, scanning through position one, position one, position one, position one, position one. You know, all of these really poor click-through rates are associated with banner position ones. So pretty interesting stuff here. Um, one thing that we find is that if we compare to a me method that we're about to talk about, partition models, let me actually build this partition model right here and talk about it a little bit. Partition model gives us another way of looking at probabilities of our event of interest for different combinations of characteristics. If I make this tree here, no is corresponding to basically not clicking. Yes is corresponding to clicking. And so we see that there's a group of ads here that have an overall click-through rate of 5.9%. So 94.1% are not clicking. And that looks like site IDs S1, S3, S4, S5, and S8. 
particularly bad at the click-through rate. So the non-click-through rate is 94.1%. And notice that we are actually able to squeeze out a little bit extra, find a subset of ads that have an even worse click-through rate if we do this market basket analysis here. So we'll talk a lot more about these decision trees and actually using them to make decisions later on. But for now, it looks like we're done with the activity.